Hey guys, and welcome to episode 36 of the Garage Athlete Show. I'm here with myself and my co-host Daniel Fraser to talk through all things home gym, training, nutrition, and you get to have us in your ears for another half an hour, 40 minutes this week. So how are you, Dan? How are things? I know yeah, good, you, man. having your life ruled by four women must be challenging. Yeah, it's tough. It's just hard. They tell me anyone that has three kids and finds it easy, especially when they're newborns <laughs> no. as well. It's, uh, all three yeah, kids but... under four now? Yeah, well, four one's, four, four, one's four, four three, and the other... Four, one's the other four. Yeah, one's four. The other two are 14 weeks. And they, nice. they just start getting in some form of routine. But it's, yeah. yeah, a little bit better. But yeah, need the other one to go to school. Need these two <laughs> to keep need... sleeping. Yeah. I mean, like... I'm lucky if if they sleep three hours through the night at a time, that's considered a good night. So wow. you can imagine, I can't remember what it's like to sleep all night, but you know, yeah. never mind. But yeah, I managed to get <laughs> some get form of... They always, yeah. um, they get better. Uh, yeah. just how, how's, your, how's your look? Um, well, cabin fever is probably the only way to describe it. Um, mm. Like the 15-year-old and the 10-year-old just like like fight constantly just because they're getting so bored of their yeah. consoles and stuff like they can be on it for like three hours and then you can just hear them going into each other's room just to wind the other one up but then so 16 year old will go and wind the 10 year old up like gets him wound up into an absolute frenzy and then retreats mm -hmm. back into his own room and then the 10 year old wants to then go and get him back but he's really wound up so he takes it way too far and they end up just, oh my God, it's just the amount of times I'm having to shout upstairs and be like, can you two pack it in? It sounds like you're going to come through the floor. I've turned into my dad. I've literally turned into my dad. Can you pack it in? You sound like you're going to come through the floor. Yeah, I can imagine boys are pretty full on as well. <laughs> Jesus. And then Willow still doesn't sleep through the night. So she's yeah. to me. Um sometimes she'll come into bed with us and she'll go straight back to sleep but other times she'll just be laid wriggling kicking normally it's on my missus so i just turn over and go back to sleep and as soon as my weight goes over 80 kilos as well i start snoring so yeah she's kicking me several times in the night at the moment it's amazing so, hey, you just get one of those cpap machines eh? i've got I've got the the strips and when they stay on they're great but like yeah, they I'm often decent. like come off in the night and I'll just be like what is that I'm peeling this really sticky nose strip off me and it's taken all the hairs out and everything it's awful so yeah if anybody <laughs> who's listening knows like any like home remedy as I said as soon as I come back under 80 kilos I'm fine it's as soon as I get to 80 kilos I put in a little bit of body fat like around here and it's just everything collapses and I can't breathe anymore <laughs> Yeah, well, I think you've, you've you've nailed it there. It's the it's the body weight thing. I know in strongman, there's a big uh, there was a big uh, basically stat everything said everyone need a CPAP, and basically all everyone went on the NHS doing sleep studies to get CPAPs because uh, they're all fucking huge, uh, big guys. Which is you know I, I, I get it, but at the same time you know you're a, you're a, you're not <laughs> when you look at the body comp of some of these dudes, I'm like you really should maybe just lose a bit of fat and build back up because <laughs> like it's because your neck's so fucking fat that's why you can't breathe yeah but it is a, it is a neck circumference thing that's why these people can't you know they struggle so as you get heavier your neck gets a bit thicker so it's uh, harder to breathe but <laughs> you know when you look at some of these dudes you're like come on man like yeah <laughs> you, you know it's like drop. well if you look yeah. at eddie hall or hafior they're getting ready for this boxing match now they've mm -hmm. each dropped at least two or three stone in fat and like I'm not being funny. How can you be? What? How? How much does Eddie Hall weigh now? Like twenty-one stone or something? Even with all the. I, I don't half. know, mate. He's, he's he still abs. must be around one fifty or so. Yeah, and it's like how? Like how? Like it? It just blows my mind that somebody can be like twenty stone and have abs. It's just just a absolute hunk it's of insane amounts of muscle mass. I mean, this is yeah. one of the. Uh, my thing is like i'm you know i, I wouldn't say I'm deep into a cup but i've moved more to what i'm experimenting because i've never done it well no i have i did a bit of mountain dog s style training so like a chest and shoulders day a leg day a back day and an arms day but i haven't done that for years so now i've gone more towards like push legs 
it goes push legs back so push pull back and then you sprinkle in some accessories uh when you as in you know maybe calves or a bit more arms if your biceps are feeling all right I'll thread a bit in but i'm trying to see if all the strength and power work i've done has laid a great foundation for going mm. back into more aesthetically minded training i mean don't get me wrong i'm still more and more interested in the, the, maybe, no no that, that's a lie no, I, i'm still interested in the one max but I'm, I'm i'm keen to see how shifting the focus away from just being as strong as humanly possible in squat bench deadlift and press to moving over to some other stuff so focusing more on how the you know muscles not necessarily movement you know i'm now snatch grip deadlifting instead of deadlifting because i want to work i want i need to build some thickness in my upper back which is where i'm weak actually so funny that where you're you know you don't look as good on stage is sometimes where you're weaker as well not always but it's a good sort of rule of thumb so i need to add some thickness through my back i've got a decent in terms of width but i've never had like that big thickness throughout my back which shows in my lifting as well my squat and bed my squat and deadlift aren't too far apart they're only about 20 30 kilos different whereas some people have like 100 kilo different and you can see it in their back they're just fucking massive erectors slab of meat yeah <laughs> yeah so i was like okay what if i do variations like you know jordan peters is big on this and it makes sense when you think about it stiff leg deadlifts like you're not relying on leverages you're just relying on just <laughs> sticking your eyes up high in the air and then using that to get the way up in, and you're using a, a big stretch reflex as well so i'm like okay so i'm getting time under tension and putting myself biomechanically in a position to use my back more to make it harder. I was like, I'm going to do stiff leg deadlifts and snatch grip deadlifts. Yeah, so I'm going to sense. progress those. So, so basically, I'm, I'm keen to see what doing all the strength training for so long transit, translates into more aesthetics kind of training. So yeah. when you see like, you know, Thor and Eddie Hall, they don't look like bodybuilders because they haven't spent time, loads and loads of time doing it. But at the same time, I'm sure they'd do all right if they wanted to get really lean and go on stage. I'm sure they do. Well, look well. at Mark Bell. Did he yeah, um, yeah, yeah. prepped for a show with Mike O'Hearn, didn't he? Uh, <laughs> yeah, last yeah. year or the week before, the year before. And it yeah. was literally... I think the war on carbs. And didn't they do like, yeah, the war on carbs, the carnivore diet was what they were doing yeah. like the whole way through and stuff, wasn't it? And it was... Like, he didn't look half bad to... Um, he went yeah. into an over... Uh, was it the masters or the grandmasters I, can't remember. I, uh, went, I think i think it was over 40s I, I, one of those but i think you know <laughs> not often there's probably one or two people in that comp like you said when you did your comp but still he got he got a nick and he looked you know did, did really fucking well but he's he's that kind of guy anyway like he'll just yeah put himself to it and that's why he's a me here millionaire hey? but yeah. um yeah but, but he's always been quite the american powerlifters are quite big on accessory work um power building per se or doing a lot of the fluff stuff not all of them but the the guys who tend to be on a bit more gear tend to be whereas the natty yeah. guys tend to be more you know i'm of the opinion i've 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 had my gym the most success i've ever had in terms of not physique but just performance on the platform was working squat bench deadlift and a few variations very little to zero isolation i was almost at the i was of the opinion now that it actually took away from my training but i've run cycles where i've done Squat bench deadlift, tons of accessories. I looked a lot better. I felt a lot better, but I don't think it really improved my performance. But long run, it might have meant I've got the muscle there to improve my performance when I start peaking, etc. But it was interesting there. Like I do think there's a bit of a trade-off if you put loads more work into your accessories. That's great, but you will be more like what we call the power builders kind of thing, mm. which is probably the best route for most people. But if you want to be, you know, if pure out and out powerlifter, then you kind of have to do focus on squat bench deadlift. It's all about that specificity, isn't it? So yeah. it depends on what your goal is. If your goal is to be a hybrid athlete, you've got to train like a hybrid athlete. If your goal is That's to it, be yeah. an out and out powerlifter, you you have to focus on that area. If your goal is to be an out and out bodybuilder, then you probably shouldn't be going below six reps on any exercises in my I think you should really, really think you should really really think about what exercises you're doing I've, I've been watching yep. a few Dorian Yates videos recently and he just speaks sense like whether you agree with heavy duty 
training or not, whatever the science says, um, if you're a volume guy or not, he was onto something about choosing the right variations. He was like straight up in an interview, like they were, they were like, why do you think Ronnie Coleman got injured all the time? And he's like, well, he, he kept doing powerlifting when it was a bad idea. He flat out says, you know, these are my words. He said it was a bad idea. There was, I see no benefit for him doing what he was doing uh, when he was doing those crazy big lifts. I mean, yeah, it's brilliant to watch. We love it. But he was saying, you know, I, I very early on in my career stopped squat bench deadlift tip those kind of things because i knew there was um obviously the injury risk but i could get much more out and i think you do this in your training anyway of doing other variations yeah. and keeping a bit healthier and he says i think apart from his you know his shoulder was his screwed and his bicep detached but i mean he's, he's, he did all right yeah you know, in terms of injuries no not in terms of look at jay that, cutler. That guy's question yeah like yeah, jay cutler a... doesn't believe in training to failure like never yeah. never used to do sets below i think it was like eight went for more like pump training and he's like he's as healthy now as he well probably had a little bit less juice but yeah. like in terms of like business like he flies around the world he's got no major injuries he still looks like a fucking ken doll like yeah. whereas ronnie coleman's walking around with a zimmer frame yeah so, it's, it's quite it's, uh, did you watch that film with him ronnie coleman king one of my favorite films um, probably yeah, the best it was, it was a like, documentary I've seen. Yeah, it was a bit sad, but at the same time, you're like, well, it's not sad. He's not sad. He doesn't, he seems no. to be right. And he's made his millions, but you're like, God, you see some, and especially when you follow his Instagram, the amount of back surgeries he's had. Well, in the last one, he's got so much scar tissue now in his back that they couldn't go in through the back. They had to go through his stomach, take his intestines out so that they could get to his spine, fix what they needed to fix put his intestines back in and then sew him up. So, I mean, I'll straight out say that I, at 23, was nearly going to get a spinal fusion in my lower back where they fuse, they take out your disc mm. and fuse your vertebra together. And it's got such a high failure rate that it's got its own condition called failed back surgery because it just, it pretty much doesn't work. Yeah. Right. And to think, Ronnie, uh, like I stopped at that surgery and looking back, I'm very glad I didn't take that option because yeah. I think I really would have screwed myself up. I think if you get your neck fused, it's okay because it's only you know, a small vertebra and it's not necessarily as big and bulky as your lower back. But I'm glad I didn't have that one. I had something else, but he's had tons of stuff like tons of stuff and you can see it there and i mean yes he was watching him he's, he's done far more than i would, could ever dream of and that's but, what you've got to look like yeah is it worth being eight times mr olympia but then basically from what when he retired mm. probably had what two or three years after retiring and then for the next 10 he's probably in constant pain Mm -hmm. um but he seems pretty happy with his life like that's he it is, isn't it yeah. he is the goat in terms of bodybuilding he is the goat he we probably won't see somebody that genetically gifted with that sort of work ethic for at least the generation so he's going to go down as the greatest bodybuilder of all time because yeah as things move forward always people the people are always nostalgic for the past they're always going to say the past is better um, and he's happy. So all these people that are just like, oh, well, he's messed himself up. Yeah, but he's happy. There's plenty of people out there that are like lower in terms of like their success. And they're just not happy with life because they're always chasing that next thing. Mm -hmm. Whereas he's, he's it's like, done, yeah. yeah, whether, um, whether I'm messed up or not, like I, he's happy. He's got his daughters, he's got his business. He can do what he needs to do. He can get on a leg press and, Still shout, yeah, buddy, rub that weird cream stuff that he puts on himself. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right, I mean, should we get I, some questions? Yeah. yeah, yeah, sure, let's go. Yeah. Okay, so Con Reed, in terms of coaching and PT, etc., is college worth it or would you suggest jumping straight into a paid course? I know you touched on it a little bit in episode one. So college in this sense, if he's talking about like, a levels or degree so tech i think or something like that yeah so i did a b-tech in sport and exercise science i got my level two qualification while i was at college the college actually paid for it and then i went on to do a sports science degree 
do I think it's got me ahead in terms of personal training? Probably not, because the guy that's got four years experience on me as a trainer would have been in the better position kind of when I graduated. It all depends on like what level of athletes you want to work with, whether you want to become a personal trainer or a strength and conditioning coach, because in order to become a strength and conditioning coach, you need a college and then a degree and then getting on some sort of internship. Like that's the route that kind of most people go. I think we had Jack on the podcast. I can't remember what episode it is, but I'll DM it across to you, Con. Um, so I went to uni with Jack and I've kind of gone into uh, personal training and working in the, um, the private sector, whereas he's gone on to be a strength and conditioning coach at Everton Ladies. So we went through college, university. He's gone on and got his master's. He's then had to then get an internship and it's a lot more of an academic route. Whereas if you just want to work with the general public and you, you don't really need it, will it give you... I don't think being able to read journals that like, gives you an advantage because every man and his dog is a, um, what's it called? Uh, I can't remember the term they use for themselves now where they like use science to back everything that they do. Oh, um, evidence-based. Yeah, evidence-based. Like you can be evidence-based and not have a degree. You can be evidence-based and be an absolute idiot. Um, you can be evidence-based, just copy whatever Lane Norton says. Yeah. That's all they do, yeah pretty much so do you need it not necessarily is it a great experience to go and do yes I absolutely loved my time at university um is it worth going into like 50 grand or whatever thing you're worth of debt at the moment if you just want to be a personal trainer probably not um if you want to be a strength and conditioning coach you're going to need to so hopefully that answers the question I know Dan you've gone a completely different route haven't you in terms of your education yeah I mean I played I'm screwed as well, Nox, mate. Now, I, I mean, I was, I've been coached since I was 15 by some very, very good high-ranked S&C coaches um, since I was 15 all the way through to 23. Um, I was a professional athlete, so that's kind of where I learned. And I had a massive passion for the training and lifting anyway, so I kind of bent the ear off, chewed the ear off all my coaches. Um, really, <laughs> like it was a bit annoying, actually. So I went that route of playing in the sport and learning about it and seeing practically what worked, what didn't work and learning from some good guys. I, that is definitely a big part of my education. I did a course which took a few weeks, I think. I went in person with, I don't know what they call Fit Training, I think was the company I used. And I went on like a two-week course, uh, two two-week courses, I think, to get my um qualification and then i went out and it, from there it's all you know your own learning and working what works what doesn't work and working with lots of different people because you you start thinking you know quite a lot and you're definitely going to change the world and help tons of people and you soon realize that <laughs> it's not quite the way it works and not everyone's a professional athlete and you have to learn about different things and what you know what works for people to get results but if you're, yeah, I think Don nailed it earlier. If you want to be in an SNC, have to get a degree. If you don't, you don't need a degree, but you have to get a qualification. But then, even then, I'm, I'm sure some, I'm sure some PTs don't have a qualification. You know, I'm sure quite a few. It's an unregulated industry. So if you yeah. want to go and work in a gym, you probably need to have your level three. A yeah. lot of PTs like don't have any form of qualification. However disclaimer if you don't have a level three you can't get insurance because it invalidates your insurance so yeah. do not practice as a personal trainer without valid insurance because if you injure somebody and it's like a, say for example you get somebody under a squat rack and they've got a weak spine and you haven't done your proper park you and they crush a vertebrae and they're in a wheelchair for the rest of their life if they sue you you're going to be paying that debt off like forever so yeah. yeah, don't train people without insurance. You can really, really hurt people as a coach and you need to kind of cover your own back or you're going to be paying for somebody's medical bills for like the rest of your life. Um, okay, next questions from Ben Ingerson. 
Uh, for people looking to build on strength in their bench, deadlift, squat, and overhead press, what would be your top three accessory recommendations for each of those areas to support improvements? Um, so you're quite a big accessories guy, aren't you? So for, for me, like, it, uh, I would just pick exercises that mimic the movement in some way. So for your bench, instead of using a barbell to bench, maybe do an incline dumbbell. Um, chest press because it's obviously going to build up the same muscles um, and then also it's going to be person dependent so some people are going to be stronger through their chest so they then need to work on like their triceps so maybe doing rack lockouts and things like that would be more beneficial others the bar is going to get stuck at their chest so doing things that work on um the, the initial press off the chest. So things like pause reps. So make sure they pause for like one or two seconds off the chest. And it's this, then the same principle across all the different lifts. Like you need to figure out where in that lift you were particularly weak and work on those weak links to bring up then the whole lift. That's how I would look at it. Um, I'm not gonna go through three options on each one of those because we'll be here all day. Um, yeah. And you're the expert, so I'm going to let you answer. Yeah, this. no, it's, it's good. I think you answered that really well. Um, yeah, first off, find out where you're weak. You need to work out, so you need to max out or do a max set and find out where the lift feels the hardest. Then you need to typically, if you're going to work it yourself, I would suggest splitting the lift into two, uh, two days. So doing one day of your main lift, the second day of the variation to build your main lift. So I mean, if you're looking for just you know general rule of thumb you know it's for deadlifts for most people stiff leg deadlifts uh, we talked about earlier it's just a harder position using more back uh, for squats pause squats are a great place to start um for, for if we're talking about getting strong and squatting pausing in wherever you're weakest so for most people it's in the bottom of the squat i actually find pausing on the way down towards the top of the squat better for me so it's trying to find where you need the work to spend the time working on for bench press yeah close grip bench press would be my first go-to for for a military press i'm a big fan of partial pressures um for most people when you're struggling at military press it's always going to stop around here so it's your triceps kicking in so i mean there, there's some things but i literally spend my life <laughs> working with different variations trying to find the right ones for the right people some of it's trial and error use your best guess but you really have to choose one, stick with it for a good while, then test, and then see if it's done the job it needs to. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it, it, it's a big, it can be quite a big thing. But I mean, it, you have to work out what part of the lift you're weak in, and then target the accessory, the variation to hit that. Definitely. So yeah, we're not going to answer like the three variations for each one just because that's going to take us all day and yeah i mean we'll talk to you maybe speak to ben most days anyway yeah. so just ask yeah, us exactly so uh ricky siddle i have limited range of movement in my left leg following significant injuries compounds to the femur plus two inches lost bone on your tibia so i'm guessing that means one leg's gonna be slightly longer than the other knee smashed and ankle all generally fine now but i do have a limited range of movement in the left knee somewhere between 80 to 90 degrees are squats still beneficial despite not getting maximum depth or is there a better alternative currently working on the principle they don't hurt and over time have increased the kg significantly so they must be doing something so that's the first half of the question is squatting to parallel like necessary um And then the second question, is there an exercise that can be supplemented for this bits? I'm missing through reduced depth. Um, I'm gonna let you tackle this one first, if you don't mind, so I need to have a little think about it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's a big one, isn't it? Um, yeah. It, it, it sounds like you, you're finding a way around your problem. The joy of getting strong is finding solutions to your problems. Like you're probably, be working out for you what works much better than any expert could ever tell you and it sounds like you know i haven't, I haven't seen a, a full video or spoken to you before or anything but it kind of sounds like you're working out a way to squat as best as you can with the problems you have so 
squatting to parallel is fantastic. That's actually an achievement considering how many problems you have. I have people I've worked with who <laughs> I don't know, really struggle to hit parallel and they've got no big problems, you know, a few mobility restrictions, but nothing like what you're going through. So yes, you can squat. If it's not painful and the doctor or a physio who ever worked with said that you can do this as long as it's done in this way, then yeah. That it sounds like you found a solution to it in terms of are you missing out yeah you might be but this is where you know i'm sure this is where i'm going to try and help you out here don this is where the bodybuilding side of things can really help yeah if you're not feeling you're working as much as you want to or feel you're missing out on some training by not because you're not efficient at squatting then yeah, there's tons of other things you can do. Um, so that's where learning about some bodybuilding style training and how to program that in with your training could probably be a really good um, thing for you. Might even look at putting squats last in your workout and smashing everything before you get to that. Yeah. So what I would say in this is I'd, I'd split the answer into two categories. One, if you haven't got all those issues like squatting to 80 to 90 degrees just being able to squat to 90 degrees is like a big achievement when you're you've got a healthy like full range of motion no not lost two inches off your tibia like so the answer i'd give to somebody who's completely healthy would be improving mobility try and get to get to squat to parallel or Slightly lower, although um, apparently squatting below, like there's no point squatting below parallel just because nobody uh, yeah, ever that. did that ever. Um, <laughs> so some of you guys will get that reference if you follow yeah. Elliot on Instagram. Um, that's probably going to trigger him, isn't it? So no, that's not Elliot saying it. That's Elliot calling somebody out for saying that before I <laughs> get into trouble with Elliot. Um, you've kind of hit the nail on the head really there Dan with with your issues Ricky like you're going to have to find the way that works for you like is it like the most what's what's even the right world optimal way to squat not being able to get to parallel like probably not is squatting to 80 90 degrees the, the making the best of a situation for yourself 100% if you're worried squatting below parallel, the only thing you're kind of really missing is the stretch reflex on your hamstrings and then maybe a little bit of kind of glute activation. So if you're looking to hit like those areas because you want that bubble butt, like powerlifters always get, then like hip thrusts with a bar is going to hit your glutes. It actually works your glutes a lot better than a squatting variation does. Um, they've done like, e not e is it ECGs? Um, we got you got in trouble the other week actually because uh, the other month uh, they did they, there was another son that actually found squats recruited more and he just went oh, like really? shit on it and we were like oh come on you always go on about a confirmation bias bro <laughs> but yeah it was it was interesting that one actually caused a bit yeah. of a ruckus in the uh, industry fair enough um so yeah there's many exercises that you could do instead um you can do split squats um hip thrust yeah, there's, like there's tons i mean like there's this that'd be worth maybe a conversation with us like yeah. there's, there's tons of different things you can do but it's going to be one of those things you're going to have to have a little try of things you know i did the other day i squatted and it was meant and then i went on to split squats to shift the focus more onto sort of glute hand tie-in and it fucking killed my hips actually which is good because that's where i'm weak but um it was nice to pick a variation in a range of motion which was still good but i didn't have the stress through my back so that's me working with my problems for, for, to get more stimulus instead of squatting more and at my risk of back injury i did more split squats and then i would halve the load put the less stone through my back but still got a great session in Fair enough. Um, i've just lost the questions now i think the next one's something like how do i get bigger biceps uh, uh bigger red biceps because was it yeah. <laughs> remember that picture was that? Bridge, that's it uh any advice on how to get bigger and stronger biceps and forearms um thick bar baby thick bar well if you've never work. done it if you've never done it whack some fat grips on your um easy bar your straight bar like definitely it's a way to very easily get some gains very quickly if yeah. you want to work more forearms um reverse grip 
buy some cars and mint. Don't take this personally, Will. Um, I've just looked at his profile. You you just need to get bigger everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, put some weight on, like big compounds, like focus more on the big compound movements first. So yes, growing big arms is great, but your arms won't grow if your chest and your back and your legs and just it's, you, you've got to grow the trunk first it's like when you're you know, with a tree yeah i think there was a polyquin thing on that saying you need to gain a certain amount of body weight to grow your arms yeah which kind of makes sense really when you think about it yeah so yeah, so for so, you mate uh, i mean i can't see a picture but i would suggest getting really good at pull-ups like close grip pull-ups um in yep. here like really smash those if you can start repping out you know sets of 15 close grip pull-ups then you're probably ready for some direct bicep work so yeah you know that's a that's a goal to work towards definitely so yeah um just generally get stronger all around don't yeah. be afraid to kind of put some weight on as well and then yeah but pull-ups are a brilliant variation for building arms and then once you've got those the foundations in place adding things like fat grips or thick bars is always going to kind of work your forearms and stuff as well um i quite like dead hangs for uh forearm and grip strength yeah, um, yeah great idea. and those transfer quite well across to pull-ups as well so uh ewan chapman first would be for people who are currently hitting or stuck on a fat loss plateau how would you suggest you get around that plateau we discussed that quite in depth yeah, on go, the yeah. nutrition podcast I've, I've put for anybody who's listening to this that was episode what are we on now 34 so be episode so episode 34 was um quite in depth in terms of nutrition and we went actually quite into how you would get through a plateau and um, secondly would what would you say is the most versatile bit of equipment that can be used a barbell yeah um or would you say dumbbells dumbbell, more equipment? Barbell. the most first yeah, I guess probably a bow. We can do lots of things with that. I don't know. I think uh, if you if you've got a landmine, then yeah. a barbell like you can do so much with. Again, barbells or dumbbells are going to be the most versatile. That's why they always have them in gyms. <laughs> you can go to a powerlifting gym, a boxing gym. They have yeah, uh, most gyms. Are, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah a barbell. Yeah, they're pretty versatile, right? There has been a massive trend, hasn't there, like of people trying to use other stuff for other things. Yeah, which they're not designed. Like shoulder for... pressing on a leg press or something like yeah, that. Yeah, like, there's a lot in, of that. Um, I don't... Glute I mean... bridges on a hamstring curl machine or something like that. Yeah, I used to use it for my neck, like doing that with it. Yeah. But like, there's, there is, like, and I love, I love the ingenuity, and it's quite yeah. fun, and it's all part of the home gym. But there does come a point where you just like you could just use it for what it's made for if you want. Like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That it is quite fun. Um, <laughs> the best I, I mean, trying to think, shit, I've done with stuff which I probably shouldn't have. I, I quite like trap bar overhead pressing. I, that, yeah, that's a nice one. Using a trap bar to press, uh, keeping that neutral grip. Yeah, stuff like you know, bench benches can be really versatile in terms of if you can do chest support rows, Bulgarians benches, uh, hip thrust. Um, yeah, and then I guess dumbbells can be used for everything. That's probably about it, really. Yeah, maybe a kettlebell can be thrown in there as well. Yeah, pretty versatile. Um, yeah, these are all like staples that should be in your home gyms, guys. Like buy the stuff that's you're going to get the most bang for your buck out of. And hamstring curls slash leg extensions are for bodybuilders only. <laughs> Oh uh, yeah. If you if I had the space, I would have kept it, all right? I would have kept it. But for the size of footprint and for how yeah. loud, like mate, I was eyeing up a watt bike and it was a great deal. It was actually 900 quid second hand, which like is fucking expensive, but they're two and a half grand you. Yeah. I was like, oh, yeah, I've got, I've got to get this. Like, I need a bike. I was like, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm about to drop nine on a grand on something that will be used the least in my gym. And when you say it like that, it's just like, what am I doing? Like, I've got a ski yeah. egg and I love it. It's brilliant. But it doesn't get used as much as, you know, by barbell will. And yeah. it's a fraction of the cost. Um, the bar to the ski egg, like, the cardio is fucking so, expensive. 
you'll you'll love this. So I bought my spin bike, which is like you know, like a proper gym spin bike. So mm. the ones that if you bought it new, they'd probably cost like six, seven hundred pounds. Guess yeah, how much I had a Facebook Marketplace. I don't know. Seventy quid. quid. Yeah, I've got a star. I had a Star Trek Pro, which was brilliant, yeah. but I got rid of it because I didn't have the space at the time. But um, it, it's, it's one of those I picked up before way. COVID. I just spent like one hundred and twenty quid on one of those cheap. The they are proper cheap, flimsy. Like felt like it was going to break every time yeah. I was riding it, and then that came up on Facebook Marketplace. I was like, I'm not even negotiating. Like seventy yeah. quid, I will buy. I literally drove there in my missus's car within the hour. Being like, I am not letting this get away from me. Mate, I, I, did that with a, properly. I did that with a Concept 2 row machine. One popped up for 50 quid and I was like, bang, yeah. like, I'll get drive now. Yeah. I had to drive to Sunderland <laughs> to get it. Like, it was like, <laughs> my, my missus was a bit, yeah, a bit suspect to me for doing it. But you know what? Best decision I've made in gym equipment. I flipped it during COVID and it was, yeah, yeah I'm very glad I did that. Fair enough. Okay, thirdly, for people wondering on a weight belt, should this be used on heavy lifts to aid core stability, but on lighter sets used without to help strengthen muscles through accessory lifts? You've answered your own question. Yeah. Uh, yes. For me personally, I would only advise like wearing a belt on maybe your top, top heavy sets. So you should be able to handle the weight without a belt, like up to a certain point that's going to be different for each individual. For me personally, I use it on hack squats and that's it. I've started deadlifting beltless now just because I want to develop my spinal erectors and actually I'm now nearly, I think I'm, I'm doing 140 for touch and go reps now, which I was doing that with a belt and knee sleeves on. I'm not doing touch and go. Um, the last time that I was kind of deadlifting, I think the most I've ever done is 170 for like sets. So my deadlift dropped right back down to like 100 and I've slowly kind of worked it back up from there. So if you're a power lifter and you're trying to get as much weight on the bar as possible, then belts are a brilliant tool. When the weight gets up above a certain like amount, like just having it there for like safety is quite a good idea learning how to use a belt properly is essential like the amount of people i've seen in commercial gyms that are just walking around with it i saw one guy like on a recumbent bike wearing his weightlifting belt like really? you are literally like a gym meme been waiting to happen <laughs> okay i've not, not seen that before he just didn't know how to use it properly. You could tell when he was lifting, he wasn't even using the belt properly. Um, it was like over tight to the point where he's having to like breathe in. It was like, your yeah, spine's probably you more uh, unstable yeah. now. Yeah, um, absolutely right. So yeah, absolutely. I don't know if you've got anything to add to that. Uh, I mean, yeah, I mean, you basically nailed it. I mean, a belt's a tool to lift more weight. Lifting more weight it means potential more volume, more growth um it was a weight sets rep so if you put the weight up you can get more out of it so yeah i'm a big fan of a bill i get loads out of mine um if i'm doing a period of beltless training i won't wear a belt if i am squatting uh, close to comp or really going for it i'll put a belt on way under 80 percent. i know there's this big thing saying you should be able to do it about this under a certain percentage, which I guess is kind of true, but I kind of find if I'm deadlifting with a belt, it does change the mechanics slightly. So yeah. I need to practice wearing the belt. And if I'm going to squat with a belt, as soon as it gets to 140, I'll put the belt on because I want to yeah. practice that brace against the belt and how it feels like replica as we get heavier. So yeah, basically what you said, but yeah, that's it. Yeah. Okay, Daniel King, as a soon to be dad, is it realistic to think I can carry on Six days training place, carry on six days training plan once the baby comes. I know timings will have to change, but did you find you just didn't have the energy when you did get a bit of free time? Um, I've only had one child and I went straight back to working in a gym. So like I used to train on my dinner break. Like I'd get an hour dinner break, I'd train for 45, 50 minutes and then like inhale my food in like 10 minutes. 
So when my little girl was born, it didn't really affect my training. What I would say to you is like, one, like what's your relationship like? Like how supportive is your missus of you training that often? And has, if, if it's your missus's first child as well, like there's gonna be a lot of stress and strain and lack of sleep. And you've got to remember you're in a partnership. So if it's really, really important to you to get your six days in a week before whatever reason, I don't know, I don't know like where, what level you compete at or anything like that, then there is a way around it. And by finding a compromise of, okay, you look after the baby while I go and train for an hour, I will look after the baby while you go and do something for yourself, then there's got to kind of be a little bit of give and take with it. Um, for me personally, if I, well, if we have another kid, like I won't be training like as much as I do now. I'll just say that kind of like off the bat, I want to bond with the child. Um, I want to be there. I want them to know like who I am. And training is one of those things that it can take a back seat for six months and then I can kind of get back into it or I can do what I can when I can I'd adjust my program to fit kind of like around what was happening at that time. I know Dan is literally kind of going through this. So I'm, I'm sure he can run you through like how he's adapted things, but you don't train six days a week anyway, so. No, I never have, although I'm considering if I ever get around to potentially looking at between four and six a week. But the question is, it's it's only an hour a day if you train. And I find if you're worried about sleep and all that, if your wife is breastfeeding, it doesn't really change your life that much in terms of your own personal like schedule. So if you're still working and doing, like you said, you were still working so you could go on your lunch and do that. Yeah. Um, so it wasn't really a big change. It, it all depends on how difficult the child is. My first daughter had colic for, well, <laughs> permacolic for like two, three years. And it was, it was awful. I made a lot of bad decisions when we were, when we had her in terms of I kept competing when I shouldn't have. And I was taking time out to do things I shouldn't have. And I, put, I always say this, but I put my hand up. I was extremely selfish with my training. I prioritized it very high like my life didn't really change at all i just kept training if anything i trained more but that's the flip side my wife's life completely deteriorated went in the shitter and was over so you can kind of see what's going on there with how much i trained um while my baby was born i was determined to not let my life be any different but i wish i wasn't like that I was a bit more so um maybe a bit more, I don't know if sympathetic, sorry, Weber made sure that chose, as much as training was a priority, I should have shifted my daughter higher up. Not to say no, she was a big part of my life. I look, you know, I took care of her two full days a week, so I did a lot, but I definitely think in the early months with how difficult she was, I should have changed it. And I think I have this time round with twins. <laughs> with twins, you can't, you can't train. You just cannot. When one goes down, the other one's waking up and it, it's impossible to leave someone alone with three kids and during lockdown to train it just if you just see that in your head can i go train for two hours and you look after the kids who is going to scream the house down you're not allowed help from anyone else no one can come into the coffee there's no baby groups no you can't you're just being an arsehole so it's only recently when hence the reason we're recording this podcast on a sunday night my children my twins have only just started in the last week so that's one week have been going to bed about 7 30 when my older daughter goes to bed so I'm, I'm like, shit, I've now got some time to train, which is brilliant. Um, and I'm How really, old are they now? I, 14 weeks. So it's taken three-ish months to get there. I mean, don't get like my daughters were born premature. My wife had COVID when they came. It was horrible, but they're, they're okay. They're here. And for 12, for 12 months, it, I didn't, the first few weeks I didn't, the training wasn't even in my head, but it comes back soon because for people like, us and people in the group it's harder not to train than it is to train and you're going to have to deal with that and I'm I, I, you know I'm being honest it was it's really it's been really really hard to not train and to lose 
the top end of my strength. Like it's been a hard pill to swallow, especially seeing, you know, your friends who've got kids, but don't have newborn twins excel. And, you know, it's the same thing with, with us in business. I, you know, I haven't been able to do what I've wanted to, uh, well, it will not progress at the rate I wanted to purely because, you know, you're trying to do all of this with, with three kids. So you'll probably find your motivation to train going back to the guy question will still be really high you'll still want it loads you'll just have to find a way in if you might have one of these babies who sleeps all day or isn't that hard you know i've got friends babies you could sit them in a bouncer and they'll be fine for an hour like that's not my children my children you leave them low for like 20 minutes they'll scream the house down so <laughs> it all depends on on the kid is it you know if that's just saying it depends but you'll you'll find a way Basically, if training is a priority, which I think by the sounds of it is if you're training six times a week, you find a way. What I did when I had my daughter, um, one of the things I did do was work out what was essential to me, squat, bench, deadlift, get those in, anything else was a bonus. Coincidentally, I actually got a lot stronger because I just focused on very simple things. I didn't have the recovery capability that I did have before the children and no sleep I dropped all the accessories all that kind of stuff just focused on those and I actually got better so it might be a great opportunity for you to find out about your training uh, a how important recovery is and b what are the most important parts of your session so instead of doing six times a week but then again six times a week could work really well as well if you've got if the you're doing six home. times a week on shorter sessions yeah yeah exactly like, like 20 30 minutes yeah like if, if you know yeah, let's think if about you, a military if, press. If you're doing like an hour, an hour and a half. Yeah. Like if you can bring that right down, yeah, like yeah. one of the benefits of having a home gym is you can squeeze in a 20 to 30 minute session just to yeah, get I got my thing yeah. and keep mental health kind of going. The other thing you want to look at is what uh, what can you train which doesn't require that much warming up. So for example, a military press, you don't, or a shoulder press, you don't need tons of mobility warm-ups that's all that kind of stuff you know you get a few sets in you're ready to go within 10 minutes so things like a, a variation of a squat where you're not lifting as much weight so a front squat you might need to not do the amount of stuff you're doing or like a beltless deadlift when you know you're not going to lift the same weight so you hit your top sets much quicker than you would do if you were taking all the time to warm up and you know this is where something maybe like a six times a week body part split program could work really well because like you say you're only doing 20 30 minutes so you're going to have to experiment and find out what works but uh, sorry but we're not we're not a bit for that question but it's okay yeah i didn't ask the title of this this podcast it's gonna be yeah like, it, it, it's it's cool i mean <laughs> like train six days a week when you've just had a baby Click and get a divorce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. yeah you, yeah your relationship be in the toilet but you'll look jacked <laughs> yeah <laughs> i was listening to um the real bodybuilding podcast um with fuad and like they got Chris Bumstead on, who's obviously um, the classic Mr. Olympia at the moment. It's like, and they put a proper clickbait title of like Chris Bumstead's going to the open. And it worked because I clicked on it. I was like, oh my God, he's really, and like it had nothing to do with that. Like Chris Bumstead like was in the episode for like five minutes because one of the guys that's on it is like his girlfriend's brother. So yeah. Chris Bumstead's girlfriend's brother. And he was just in the background. He's like, hey guys. <laughs> <laughs> but he's really into it so that everybody went and then clicked on the um clicked on the episode so yeah we need to get some clickbait in here get some get some followers okay so sam johnson more of a question for dan ways to train the log press when i can't use the actual log due to weather and ceiling height previous pb is 115 and i can comfortably clean 120 but struggle pressing anything over 100 cheers Oh my God, are you me in disguise? Right, mm -hmm. so first thing, weather depending, you're going to have to get out of that mindset. Um, I've got a guy I'm trading at the moment who is log pressing in wind, rain and snow. It's shit, but you've got to get it done. If, you, if you're that keen to log press, you'll log press. So wrap up warm, get outside and press. And I think you've got, a, I think you've got a, a Celtic log from what I remember. So yeah, you're just going to have to get out and press. Mate. Even if it's the start of session, log it all out, go back in. You're going to have to log press. There's things you can do, but if you want to get a, get good at log, you have to log. It's a fucking big, awkward beast. And by the sounds of it, you need to work on your pressing power anyway. If your cleans are 120 and your press is around 100, that's, you know, we've got some work to do on the pressing part. So to train the log without the log. And, and did you say and ceiling height's an issue? Yeah. 
yeah, first part, you know, suck it up. You're going to have to go outside, you know, train in the wind, rain and snow. I mean, weather now is actually pretty good, so that's not a, that a point anymore. Next point is work your triceps as hard as possible and your stabilizers, stabilizing muscles. What I mean by that is work the whole shoulder girdle and work your rear delts really fucking hard to stabilize. Um, one of the best things I ever did for my shoulder health and pressing was really focus on, did some work with the Forbes though, was really focus on the little muscles um, doing things like power raises, Y raises, three trap raises, uh, reverse flies, things you forget about. Put those in nearly every session, like two, three times a week will really help. But things like lying floor presses with dumbbells are great. Dips are fantastic. Close grip rend presses, seated log presses in a rack can be really good. By the sounds of it, I reckon you'll be quite strong on an incline in comparison to your log pressing. Because I think, you know, bench wise, I think you're quite a decent bencher. So I think your problem is more triceps in that upright position. So you're going to have to do, if ceiling height is the issue, kneeling shoulder presses um z presses can be really good and um, when you're sitting on the floor pressing and tons of lockout strength so partial presses that's what i would say yeah and just looking i was looking up something for the next uh question so next question any recommendations for things to read to advance programming knowledge so i'm oh god millions of them <laughs> I'm looking up. Who's is Dr. Mike? Uh, Mike, uh, Renaissance from, Periodization is really yeah, good. Renaissance He's Periodization. Done. I'm reading his hypertrophy book at the moment. Probably one of the driest, like, train. Like, I love reading about training. Like, I've read um, at least like 10 to 12, which I would call them textbooks about training. So, like, um, I'm trying to think of some of the titles now. Um, the Encyclopedia of Muscle and Exercise or something like that. Um, obviously, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Encyclopedia of Bodybuilding, Modern Bodybuilding. Um, Mike Mentzer's book, which again, these are pretty much like textbooks on bodybuilding and hypertrophy. So they are dry. Like when you read them, it's not, there's no fluff, there's no stories. It's just like science of like how to build muscle and then bro science when it's written by Arnold. Um, mm -hmm. But the Renaissance periodization book, I am really struggling to read. Like it is so like the level of science in it is like degree level. Yeah, well, so, he, he's, he's a, uh, what do you call it? He's a professor, isn't he? Yeah, well, he's a doctor. What? He's a doctor in sports physiology or whatever it is. But I've never read anything that's this in depth about. Oh, mate, try it. Try Boris Shako's book. Another. Oh, really? He's got a PhD in fucking strength training. Like, yeah, ridiculous. Uh, the book is literally like, it's insane. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 very thorough and very specific. But if you ever think uh you're a bit anal about lifting you have no idea well these, these guys are on another level but um in terms of books oh god yeah just there's fucking millions of them man i mean they relate to so check out relations periodization they're really good um yeah. oh who is it that runs um juggernaut that's really good i'll tell you what yeah. Chad, best, best one Chad i'd recommend is Smith. um scientific principles of strength training is a great read i, re I yeah. recommend that one yeah, that's a good one yeah um there, there's so many like and again it all depends on what you're training for so you're powerlifting or bodybuilding um just general kind of like health and fitness you're probably not going to want to go into like a specific niche of it um and the rest of the things for programming um wow again it's, it's just such a really really broad topic um and every man and his dog has got an opinion about like their way is being like the best way but a lot of them work for different athletes because yes genetically we're all like 99 percent the same but that one percent leads to a massive amount of variation from person to person on how effective a program is kind of going to be so yeah i think we've thrown uh, we've thrown a few titles out there haven't we um but yeah, if you want any more like specific like recommendations, just like DM one of us and then I can send you like, cause I've yeah, got yeah. like my, I've got, a, oh, I've got my audible list and stuff in my phone. I just can't 
run through it because yeah cool right that's all the questions uh, i think we've been on for about an hour um we should check and I'd definitely click the record button there because that would have been annoying um so as always thanks for your time buddy um sorry this one is late on a sunday evening um i'm gonna go see what my missus is doing and whether i've got time to do the uh show notes once this is rendered and i'll try and get it out asap but it's been great to have a catch up i know your time is precious at the moment um but we are doing what we can keep also you'll just have to be patient but yeah hopefully once the uh, girls get into a bit more of a routine we can have mine and dan's wonderful face and more kind of like regular time but you'll have to excuse us like we have families so yeah <laughs> all right well it's been great to catch up with you uh where can people find you if they want to uh, find out more uh dan frazier on facebook and bubbles and beans on instagram Perfect. And um, I am at DGPT on both Facebook and Instagram. And if you guys obviously are in the Facebook group, we're in there pretty much every day answering questions and stirring up trouble with people who buy concrete weights. Um, because that's the type Bad. of people that we are. We're not moderating, we're just winding people up. Um, but yeah, it's been great to speak uh, to you today, buddy. Enjoy the rest of yeah. the evening and I will let you go. Awesome. Take care, buddy. See you soon. Bye for now.